Welcome to Ecology Matters, a podcast from the Ecological Society of Australia, featuring ecologists from all over the country. The, the biodiversity in this part of the world is just incredible. It's, it's not just ice and snow, it's teeming with life on the coast. I see that and I say, okay, well, that's a great opportunity to study, to study it more. Yeah, looking at those sites gives you a sense of joy and, and hope. Love being around, it's incredible. It's just, yeah, it's a, it's a really awesome program and it's just so healing, like, for our whole community. It's the beauty of ecology is that it's so interconnected. Yeah, it's been really exciting, actually. Our guest today is Dr Judy Dunlop. Judy focuses on threatened mammals in Western Australia and has played key roles in large-scale fauna reintroduction and translocation programs. In 2022, she co-authored a paper looking at the role of parasites during translocation. She joined Ecology Matters to discuss why it's sometimes important for mammals to keep these parasites and for conservation managers to resist that urge to give them the flick. This paper was awarded the 2022 Austral Award. Your, your career has focused on uh, threatened fauna in Western Australia, particularly marsupials like the northern quoll. Um, yeah. It's a big question, but can you explain why you have focused on these species and what some of the main factors are that are threatening them? Um, yeah, I guess I've always been kind of fascinated with what the landscape would have looked like before Europeans got here. So um, I've spent quite a lot of time working out in the deserts um, in WA mostly and um, to look at them now and think some genius thought it was a great idea to bring sheep and cattle, it just blows my mind. And the things that used to be there were uh, all of your medium-sized hoppy smaller than a kangaroo, bigger than a mulgara, and they're just not there anymore. So that's kind of where the fascination comes from for me. Um, and, yeah, those desert ecosystems really fascinating, those tough creatures that survive in what seems like quite inhospi- inhospitable conditions to us, and they thrive and love it. And what, what are some of the threats that they're facing? Um, so obviously Europeans have brought in cats, foxes, rats, potentially disease, and those things have all marched across the landscape in various um, cohorts since, since European settlement. Um, and then adding to that the change in, in structure of the environment from um, – changing those burn regimes and removing Indigenous people who are on the landscape doing small-scale activities. Now we've sort of got these broad-scale big farms clearing and um, and introduced predators that are thriving. I mean, it all it keeps coming back to cats for me as well, you know. It seems yeah. to be a common thread of work that I've done. Um, and even when... Even when cats, um, and they might be the cause of death for a lot of these species, but we sort of also wondered about, well, are there other things that are affecting that as well? So when you have, um, uh, say, for the woilies down in the southwest forest of, of um, WA, they experienced a massive crash in the 2000s after fox baiting. Was that cats? Was that disease that cats were carrying was that some kind of parasite you know we've seen other strange losses from parasites uh like on christmas island with the mcclears rat yeah so there's a, there's a bunch of confounding factors that are all working together aren't they to to address some of these threats and some of these declines in in native mammals you've been involved in large landscape scale fauna translocation programs and reintroduction yeah. programs. Why are um, these sorts of programs, these initiatives, um, so important to to the conservation um, of our native species? Um, so there's a few species that currently cannot survive any level of cat predation. And so those are you know, things like marla, booties, 
They only exist behind fences or on islands where they're protected from cats. Um, so that means that some of these species that used to occupy two-thirds of the continent are now only on sort of 2% of the landmass and they're only on islands or behind fences. And, they, and these ones are um, often quite important to the ecosystem. So the burrowing beton, which is also called bil uh, booty, um, bilbies, golden bandicoots, those are all ecosystem engineers. So they do a lot of digging. I'm sure that um, what they do is important for the flora, you know, seed dispersal, burying seeds. Uh, and, to, and to have that completely missing from the landscape is not only tragic, but um, also probably quite unfortunate for a, for a few other species. And not to mention cultural impacts. Um, so species that Aboriginal people relied on for food, for hunting, uh, ones that are important for storytelling. I've worked with a, a few Indigenous groups who know the stories of particular animals and they've heard about them from their grandparents, they've seen the art of them, they know what the footprints look like, but they've never seen the actual animal because it has disappeared from the area where they live. Um, that's incredibly tragic. So the reintroductions are kind of the only way that you can get that ecosystem and cultural space back to something something like what it used to look like. Um, it, yeah, the work that I did out at Madawa was um, reintroducing a pile of things that should be in the desert. Um, and, yeah, you know, obviously the trick of that is that you need good source populations to get them from and then you also need the threats to be mitigated at the place where you're releasing them. There's no point putting them back in a place where the same old threats are just going to wipe them out again. If we focus on, on translocation itself, you published a paper in 2022 that looked at the role of parasites during translocation. Normally when we think of parasites, we have quite a, an intuitively negative reaction. Um, yes. but, your, but your paper counsels against that. Could, could you explain in a little more detail what that paper was looking at and what the findings around um, parasites were? Yeah, so uh, the um, the real parasite lover is my co-author, Maggie Watson, so all credit to her. I came at it from the fauna angle and she came at it from the parasite angle. And um, I guess the point that we were trying to look at was what is the best practice when you are thinking about a translocation? What's the best practice for those species involved, for the humans that are doing the work and for the um other species in the ecosystem. So um, we wanted to have some kind of guidelines that allowed people, allowed managers who are making these kind of decisions to figure out, well, if I'm bringing things from captivity um, or from an island or perhaps I'm dropping them off in a place where I've got a whole bunch of other species that have already been introduced what should my level of parasite management be? And the um, the default is nuke everything. And we're sort of arguing, well, you know, some of those species have co-evolved, the parasite species have co-evolved with those uh, mammals. They don't necessarily cause a great deal of harm and they may have some positive effects like on the immune system. And also they're valuable as a species in their own right. So the nuke everything option is not always going to be correct. And so we sort of went back through all of the literature of Australian translocations. Have people been considering this in the past? Um, the answer was largely not really. And alarmingly, even when there were um, I diseases that were identified to be quite problematic for species. Sometimes they weren't quarantined out before they were translocated. Um, so it ranges from, yes, there's an identified problematic disease that is contributing to the decline of the, of the mammal species. Okay, well, you probably want to do something about that. Um, yes, there's a problematic species that's going to 
impact the humans that are doing this monitoring. You probably want to remove those. Or if there's a whole lot of other species that could potentially be impacted by you bringing in new um, new parasites, then maybe you want to deal with those. But apart from that, leave them alone. Default is leave them alone. So there needs to be a more of a nuance, nuanced approach rather than removing them completely. Yeah, that's right. So um, yeah, so we did create a little flow chart, which I hope was helpful for everybody. Um, uh, and yeah, we wanted to point out that um, it's hard to predict what new diseases are going to do under changing environmental conditions, which is what what happens in a translocation, but also that parasites are an important part of the ecosystem. And if you get rid of everything, then um, then you might have strange um, impacts for your host species as well. And you mentioned there that um, you know you you're imagining that this sort of research and information can be taken on board by ecologists when they're planning translocations. What has the reaction been to this sort of message? Is it has it been um, accepted fairly positively? Um, and do you know of anyone that is incorporating this this knowledge into their projects? Uh, I I would hope so, and I hope that it's simple enough that people can. I think I did get a, t- a message on Twitter of someone saying, "Hey, I'm just using your flowchart in my translocation proposal," so that made me happy. Um, and it was probably that that's where they're going to be used is in grey literature in um, internal decision documents. It's not going to be um, perhaps in the published paper world. And I think uh, there's a bit of a old-fashioned view about papers being, you know, the best metric of your science. But um, I think I see a lot more outreach in terms of conversation articles or glossy one-pager info sheets um, and that sort of thing. I think um, it's important to realise that most of the people who are making these kind of decisions in politics or management, they're not delving into the scientific literature quite as much as we hope they would. What's next for you um, in in terms of this particular research? Look, this one was, um, it was actually a zombie paper from my PhD. It started as my PhD lit review for the translocations because I wondered, you know, what has been done already. And when I say zombie paper, I mean won't live, won't die. Um, and that's where the help of Maggie came in for it to actually get life breathed back into it and be published. Uh, so, yes, I think this one is probably done, but the next thing that I'm looking at at the moment is um, potential impacts of cane toads as they march ever uh, westward. Um yeah, and sort of threaten species impacts through Western Australia. Ecology Matters is a podcast by the Ecological Society of Australia, a not-for-profit organisation supporting ecologists and ecological science in Australia. We acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. To learn more about our work, Follow us on social media, visit our website or sign up to our newsletter. You can find links to these in the show notes. The theme music is Glow by Scott Buckley. Lastly, thank you to all the ecologists who have taken part in this series and shared their perspectives on why ecology matters.